Hi, everybody. I'm Ross Porter. Thanks for being with us today for our live interview with one of the outstanding pitchers in Brooklyn Dodger history and one of the outstanding men, as far as I'm concerned, in whatever field you want to talk about. He was a member of five National League pennant winners. One of them was the world champion Brooklyn Dodgers in 1955, the only title that the city of Brooklyn ever enjoyed. Those Dodgers of the 1950s were known as the Boys of Summer, and the only living member of that club is 94 years old, and what a thrill today to welcome Carl Erskine, who's at his home in Anderson, <laughs> Indiana. Carl, you don't know how much this means to me to be able to sit and talk with you again. How are you? Ross, thank you. It's so great to talk with you again, but it's been years. I mean several years since you and I have had a chance to be together. So this is a real treat for me. It's a treat for us all. Let's start from the beginning, Carl. You were born in Anderson. Have you ever called any other place home? No, Anderson, Indiana. And people often ask me, uh, Carl, now where just is, it, where is Anderson, Indiana? <clears throat> and I tell them it's easy to find. It's on the White River between Moonsville and Strawtown. <laughs> That's great. You got that. I hope now you know right where I'm at. I do. I, I do. Was Little League uh, your first introduction to baseball? We didn't have Little League in our my day as a kid, but at, at eight or nine years old, the, the park system in Anderson, Indiana, had a baseball program. It was uh, later, of course, that was a forerunner to Little League. But when I played at nine years old, I started. Uh, we played on a regular diamond, and so I was a pitcher, <laughs> and I threw 60 feet just like the big boys, but that was my beginning. Were you always a pitcher? Well, in high school, I played center field the days I was not pitching, and I liked that because as a pitcher, you know, you only pitch once every four days or so. Uh, in the major league routine, now it's five days, but... Uh, yeah, I like to play. I, I love to play the infield, but they always played me in center field. And uh, so I did play in all of our games. Uh, as a pitcher, I wouldn't have got to do that. How old were you, Carl, when it was pretty obvious that you had talent? Probably my sophomore year in high school. Uh, scouts were, were coming around. And uh, then I stayed in high school, although the Cubs offered me a chance to sign when I was a sophomore, I was 16 years old. In those days, uh, there was no draft, so clubs could sign a kid anytime, really. I think Joe Nuxall has a record actually pitching an inning or two in the big leagues when he was 15. That's right. So they could, they could sign guys anytime. But I didn't want to sign because uh, I was also on the basketball team in high school. Of course, in Indiana, high school basketball is... Yeah is the big thing. That's so nice. I didn't want to become ineligible for that. So I, on the advice of, the, of my coaches, <laughs> said, no, you don't want to do that. If you sign uh, to play baseball, you can't, you'll be considered a professional athlete and you ineligible for all sports. Yeah. So well, that, you, was, that was not a good thing. Were you allowed to talk to scouts or was that prohibited too at that time? I beg your pardon, I missed that. Could, could you talk to scouts personally? At that I'm not time? getting a good connection there, so I didn't hear yeah. you again. I'm just wondering if you were allowed to talk to scouts face to face, or that was that was uh, a, you know. that's a that's a part of it. I don't know. I think I was cautioned to not do that because the IHSAA, which is the Indiana Authority on uh, High School Athletics. Uh, was a strict body uh, protecting uh, the amateur status of all high school athletes. So they had rigid uh, rules. So I know I did not uh, I did not set up meetings of any kind with the scouts. Now they came to my house to meet with my dad uh, a, a couple of times, but uh, I know I got really. Uh, I really shook up one of the coaches when 
I got a chance to work out with one of the big league teams, Pittsburgh, uh, was trained during the war, retained, uh, trained in Muncie, Indiana. That's only 18 miles away. So uh, they wanted, some of my friends wanted me to go and try out. So I asked the uh, coach at high school if I could borrow a uniform. They said, <laughs> what do you want that for? I said, well, I want to work out. They said, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> You'll be ineligible for everything. So yeah. they jumped through the ceiling when I asked for the uniform. But um, so I didn't, I protected that. And uh, I did not, uh, I didn't want to sign when I was 16 and still a sophomore in high school. I didn't want to uh, become ineligible for all other yeah. sports. Yeah. So Tell we passed that up for sure. Tell us how you first uh, were approached by the Dodgers. Well, there was a, a scout in uh, Indianapolis. He was what they call a bird dog. He wasn't a full-time scout. Stanley Fiesel was his name. And a catcher in high school with me, Jack Rector, was also a good prospect. So Stanley Fiesel followed us around during our high school uh, schedule. And uh, that's how I, and he represented the Dodgers. So at one time, uh, he uh, graduation from high school, Stanley Fiesel came to my house and uh, he said, I got a surprise for you boys. You're going to go to New York and work out a week with the Dodgers, mm. uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. And, uh, and here's a hundred dollar bill for each of you. You're going you're gonna <laughs> to stay in a New Yorker hotel and uh and work out for so we did that so wow. now you can imagine i was not uh interested in any other team but the dodgers right after that so um that was uh, and jack rector my catcher he signed actually before i did because i already got my greetings from uncle sam to go in the navy yeah so uh, jack was not 18 yet so he he signed and i couldn't sign but uh when I was in the Navy a couple of years and then the war ended and uh, then I then I did sign with Mr. Ricky. What do you remember about the day, Carl, that you signed with the Dodgers? Well, you know, it was such a new experience. And of course, my parents, uh, uh, you, you had to be 21 years old at that time to sign a contract. Hmm. Uh, they lowered it to 18 because the draft would get you at 18. So uh, they lowered it. But at that time, so my dad had to uh, accompany me to sign. So that was, uh, and then that created a problem because um, I hadn't been discharged from the Navy yet. And uh, there was a directive by the commissioner of Happy Chandler that you couldn't sign a player until his military was uh, satisfied. So he, he uh, overruled the Dodgers and declared me a free agent. But he said, a bit of irony here, he said, normally the club that violates cannot uh, be in the mix to sign uh, again, but I'm not gonna hold the Dodgers out because my uh, directive had a little ambiguity word or two in it. And so I'm gonna lean favorably toward the Dodgers. So Carl, you can sign, you're a free agent. You can sign with anybody you want, uh, including the Dodgers. Well, the only club I was interested in was the Dodgers. So I re-signed with, with them. In fact, I got a bonus from Mr. Ricky the first time. And then when I re-signed, uh, I said, well, I'll re-sign uh, and ask for another, uh, another payment. And so I got 3,500 the first time and then I said, if uh, Mr. Rick, you'll, if you'll sign me, uh, if you'll, you'll give me 5,000 again uh, more, I'll re-sign with the Dodgers. So uh -huh. I became rather famous right. for getting two, two uh, I told Dizzy Dean this one time in an interview, and he said, I played for Ricky. I know how cheap he is. You should be in the Hall of Fame, not because you pitched two no-hitters. You got two bonuses out of Branch Ricky. And Carl, you might have been the first baseball agent of all time when you helped <laughs> Phil. <laughs> that, that was that probably been declared uh, uh, double interest or something. <laughs> yeah. Where did the Dodgers? Where, where did the Dodgers first send you to begin your minor league career? Danville, Illinois. Uh, it was called a Class B league in those days. I, I sent a full season 
uh, in Danville. I won, I won 19 games there. Then they sent me to Double A at Fort Worth, Texas. And by July of 1948, that year I went to to Texas. Uh, it was uh, I'd won 15 games by mid July. And the Dodgers called me up uh, from the minor, from the minors, so I appeared in a Dodger uniform the first time in July of 1948. Wow! Now, when you were in spring training, was the idea for you to just work on your pitches and see what you were doing well and what you were not doing, and and did the other pitching coaches from the minor league level help you in that regard? You know, Mr. Ricky was uh, an innovator himself in uh, in baseball, the baseball world. <clears throat> in spring training, we had mounds, three mounds, and then at the other end, a home plate. Mr. Ricky had designed this idea of having a strike zone outlined with, uh, with a cord, a string. Mm -hmm. And so the strings were across at the height of the shoulder and the knees, and then two drop strings down the width of the plate, and it made a visible strike zone. That was a that was a kind of a master stroke because most young pitchers who throw hard, they have trouble finding the strike zone, but that really helped the pitchers focus on. You could not only throw it as a strike, but then you could divide the strike zone up, and you could pitch to the corner outside. You could pitch high up inside. That was a, an innovative idea for Mr. Ricky, and it really was helpful for pitchers. Carl, two of the finest Dodger pitchers in the organization history, uh, future Hall of Famer Don Sutton and future Cy Young Award winner Bob Welch, who later won 27 games one year for the A's. They right. both told me in separate interviews over the years something that I never forgot. They both said to me, location is more important than velocity. I would agree with that. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, consistently being able to throw uh, at the corners of the strike zone, not just throw strikes down the middle. Uh, that's pitching. Uh, when you're just throwing strikes down the middle, that's throwing. That's the difference between <laughs> Throwing and pitching is being able to throw it to the corners, just inside, just outside. And uh, so it, Preacher Rowe was a pitcher in my era. He's a left-hander, and he was a master at never throwing a ball down the middle. <laughs> and uh, all of us young pitchers, hard throwers, we couldn't believe that Preacher could really throw a ball on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. ball. And we, we said, look at that. He, he can actually throw a ball intended to be not a strike. <laughs> we <laughs> was were it, all struggling to throw strikes. <laughs> wasn't it true that Preacher used some chewing gum at times to kind of get that ball a little slicker? <laughs> he said he used uh, beech nut tobacco, not tobacco, beech nut chewing gum. Yeah. He said it gave, gave him the best feel uh, <laughs> when he got a wad behind him. <laughs> between his fingers so yeah, yeah he had a, he had a good spitter at that time how many good pitches did you think you had oh in the, in the organization in the minor leagues yeah yeah you're talking about in the dodger organization yeah when you went into the pro pro yeah. line, what'd you well, think well i'll tell you the competition was hot for the nine they carried usually carried nine pitchers on the big league roster and uh, there was about uh, 200 pitchers in the Dodger organization. They had a big farm system, 26 teams, 200 pitchers. Wow. You were competing for the spot, eight or nine or 10 maybe spots at the top. So it was it, it produced the best of uh, that group. But, of course, the Dodgers had these hard throwers, names you probably never would hear of, like Rex Barney. Uh, he could throw a ball right through a brick wall, but most guys said, well, he, he but he can't hit the wall. <laughs> <laughs> he was a hard thrower. It was yeah. several. Jack Banna was another, uh, Carl Spooner, yeah. uh, another hard, all hard thrower guys. And uh, so they, they had a lot of competition for 
uh, reaching the 20, or excuse me, reaching the uh, maybe eight to nine spots on the roster at the top. So he had a lot of competition and that brought the best in everybody. So I was fortunate to make it through that uh, in a, about a year and a half in the minors. And Mr. Ricky brought me up. And one of the reasons he brought me up because he showed us early in our career if you could throw hard, that's one thing. If you can control it, that's another thing. But if you're a real pitcher, you'll be able to know how to take something off the pitch to throw the off-speed pitch. You can hardly convince a hard-throwing pitcher that taking something off the ball is good. They would never dream of taking anything off of the ball. They want to throw it right through the backstop. But I picked that off-speed pitch up quick and I could throw it for strikes. That's actually, I had a good curveball overhand as well, but but that off-speed pitch was the third part of my repertoire. <clears throat> that actually moved me up fast through the other pitchers. And so I think I was only in a minors a year and a half. Yeah. And I was on a big club. You know, that reminds me of, of, of catcher Norm Sherry in spring training one day, going out to Sandy Koufax who was struggling and said, Sandy, you got to use more than the fastball. And that turned Sandy's career around because Sandy, as you know, you were his teammate. He had a losing record after the first six years with the Dodgers. And the last six years, he was as good as anybody in the game. Yeah, that's true. That's exactly right. Well, a catcher, you know, uh, it's just interesting to me in the years, hundred years of baseball, the, the pitching coach was always a catcher. And it wasn't until uh, probably the mid fifties or so that former pitchers became the pitching coaches. That's right. So that, that makes sense in a way because the manager would go to the catcher, what's this guy got? What's he throwing? How good is his curveball? So he depended on the catcher to tell him what the pitcher was like that day. But uh, eventually then they uh, started using former pitchers as pitching coaches. And that's when the pitch count came in and some of the newer stuff. But uh, yeah, it, it was uh, competitive all the way in the Dodger chain because there was 200 pitchers in the system and there was only about eight or nine, maybe 10 at the most spots on the big league roster. Yeah. Do, so, you, do you like the pitch count that they have now? It serves a purpose. I don't think it's uh, smart. If I were managing a team in the big leagues, uh, I would not be locked in to the pitch count. Because if I had a pitcher that was peaking in his, uh, he's pitched seven innings and he's peaking right then with his best stuff. And I know that can happen. I've, I've pitched games where I've had okay stuff through the first six or seven innings. And made the last two innings, I had the best stuff I had all day. Yeah. And uh, so I don't quite believe in the pitch count as to lock you in. Uh, you got to use some good talent and judgment yeah. about your pitcher. And I've uh, had pitchers tell me, Carl, that they've had games where they threw 85 pitches and other games they threw 115 and they had more trouble the night they threw the 85 and they coasted with the 115. That's, that's yeah. what you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's, what, that's where the judgment comes in, where the experience of uh, a manager comes in. Um, you can delegate to your coaches or to your pitching coach, but the last word has to come from the manager. Yeah. And uh, some managers like Leo DeRocher, Charlie Dressen, they didn't depend on their coaches. They made the choice, they made this uh, decision and they didn't want any help. <laughs> but Alston kind of changed that when he came in, he did depend on his coaches. And at one time there was not a designated pitching coach per se. That came along a little after my career, but uh, the pitching coach uh, being a former pitcher makes sense because there's a lot more to pitching physically, then the mental attitude, the uh, uh, the mindset that you have on the mound, 
It's interesting. I always thought of pitching this way. Pitching is a defensive position, but you have to be on the offense as a pitcher. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. Sure does. Yeah. yeah. That was always my you. feeling. You're a, you're a defensive player, but you have to be on the offense to execute your pitches. That's right. And, uh, so that's a kind of a mindset thing, but that's the way I, that's the way I viewed it. You know, going back to what you said earlier, it reminds me, a lot of people say that there have been more successful major league managers who were catchers than there were who were pitchers. I think that bears itself out. I think it's uh, true. Uh, a lot of pitching coaches, of course, are all uh, former pitchers. I can't name hardly a manager that was a former pitcher. Uh, a catcher is like the field general. Yeah. Uh, he he kind of controls indirectly uh, the pace of the pitcher, uh, the movement of the out infielders, outfielders, from his point of view, from behind the batter's box. Uh, he is a field general. So uh, I'm not surprised that a lot of former catchers have become, become managers. Yeah. Carl Erskine is our guest today. We're going to get back to him with a lot of other baseball questions, and uh, it's just wonderful having him aboard. But I'm going to kind of change gears here for a moment, Carl. Um, you were fond of a girl in high school named Betty Palmer. Have you, <laughs> stayed, have, have you stayed in touch with Betty? Have I stayed in touch? We'll be married 74 years in October. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Is, is Betty nearby where we can say hello to her? Uh, where is Betty? Right here. Betty, do you, would you like to come over and say hello? <laughs> she's, she's nearby, but she's, she's not in the same she's area. But she's coming. Okay. Yeah, we got married uh, pretty young. Uh, both, we were sweethearts in high school. So she's been through the minors and the whole the whole trip with me and she was a great baseball wife the best story i could tell you about betty is i was pitching against the giants on a saturday game of the week and uh betty was ironing at the, our apartment in brooklyn and uh while she was ironing in front of the tv i was pitching and uh i finally ended up pitching a no hitter that day and betty didn't scorch a spot now that's teamwork. <laughs> that's terrific. And of course, you have four children, three boys and a girl. Any grandchildren? Oh yeah. How many grandkids we got now? Eight? We have ten. We have ten now. Yeah, that's wow. how, just like popcorn. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> they keep, that's they keep coming. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that, that'll help. There you go. Yeah, we Betty, lean we down got, a little bit so we can see you. Yeah, she got to bend down. So. Well, but we got her. We keep her in uniform around here. So, <laughs> yeah. You surprised me. I got lower. the winter clothes on. Get down a little lower. Oh, there you are. Look good. Oh, you got your hat on. Well, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, sure. Got to hide this gray hair. Yeah. Well, we, you are marvelous. LA. You're a marvelous couple and just a wonderful uh, set of parents. You've got the uh, the four children, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about that. But uh, I just want everybody to see you and see how good you look. Uh, well, oh. he's he's 94. You you're you're considerably younger, aren't you? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> Next month I'll be 93. Oh wow! Well, you just caught Ben Scully. He's 93. <laughs> yeah. Right. By the way, Ben told me today to send his love to both of you. Oh, good yeah, for him. Bless good. His heart. We saved his voice on our phone. Do you? Yeah, he talked to Carl. Good for yeah, you. we've got a recording. Well, okay. Betty, I'll let you go back and uh, thanks for dropping by to see us and uh, bless your heart. Thanks for giving Carl a good day. He likes to tell us stories. <laughs> yeah, Carl, as you know, folks, is a very uh, talented man, a, a fellow who's thrown two major league no hitters. He uh, pitched in 11 World Series games. He set a strikeout record in one of those World Series games against the Yankees. And we'll get to that pretty soon. But I've asked Carl to show you his excellence today as a musician. 
especially with one instrument, the <laughs> harmonica. <laughs> what are you going to treat us to today? How's bravo, that? bravo. <laughs> Magnificent. Oh, wow. That's the greatest 94-year-old oh, harmonica player yeah. in the world. That's terrific. When did you Benny, start? Benny's coaching me now. She says you played the wrong song. Oh, my goodness. Again, playing the harmonica. Oh, might have been eight or nine years old. Wow. <laughs> My dad had one around the house. I picked wow. it up. I, just... I know you've been asked to perform uh, with your harmonica at, at baseball stadiums, haven't you? How many of them? Well, I've done, I've done the national anthem several places. Uh, I always hoped I'd get a chance to do it at Dodger Stadium. And for, fortunately for me, two times I got to do the anthem. At, uh, oh, I did a lot of the NBA games in Indianapolis. Uh, yeah, the Pacers. The Pacers. Yeah. I uh, did it there the most, but uh, that was always a lot of fun. A little, a little nerve uh, rattling a little bit, but uh, it's just a lot of fun. Oh, that's terrific. Okay, you marry Betty in October of 1947. The Dodgers call you up in the middle of 1948 when you were 21, and you remain with them throughout your career until you retired in 1959 at the age of 32. Now, Carl, it's been over 65 years <laughs> since the 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers won the World Series, and that's the team we are really putting our focus on today. And I thought we could review some things for people who either don't know don't remember or forgot about that team. So if you'll bear with me, let's go position to position. And I will be focusing on those players who spent the most games at each position that year. Catcher, Hall of Famer Roy Campanella, batted 318 with 32 home runs and 107 runs batted in. First baseman, Gil Hodges, hit 289 with 27 homers and 102 RBI. Second baseman, Jim Gilliam, had a 246 average, led the team in stolen bases with 15, but was also caught 15 times. Shortstop, Hall of Famer, Pee Wee Reese, batted 282 and grounded to a surprising 22 double plays that year. Third baseman, Hall of Famer, Jackie Robinson, hit 256, but he struck out only 18 times in 390 plate appearances. Amazing. Left field was primarily played by Sandy Amaros, who hit 247 and made a catch in game seven of the World Series that may well have saved the Brooklyn season. Center field, Hall of Famer Duke Snyder, who had a monster year, batting 309 with 42 home runs, 136 runs batted in, and an on-base percentage of 418. Right field, Carl Ferrillo, hit 314 with 26 homers, 95 runs batted in, and a great arm. Now the reserves included Don Zimmer, who hit 15 homers, Don Hoke, George Shuba, and Rube Walker. Brooklyn's most frequently used starting pitchers in 1955 were Don Newcomb, who won 20 games, lost just five, and batted 359 and socked seven homers. Carl, you went 11 and 8 that year. You pitched seven complete games. Johnny Padres was only 9 and 10 in the regular season, but he won the biggest game in Brooklyn history, shutting out the Yankees 2 to nothing in game seven of the 55 World Series at Yankee Stadium. Billy Lowe is the other starter at a record of 10 and 4. In the Dodger bullpen, Clem Levine won 13 games, dropped only five, and pitched in 60 of the then 154 game schedule. Don Bessett was eight and one in relief. Carl Spooner won eight and six. 
Ed Roebuck was five and six. And there was an 18 year old kid who pitched for the 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers. His record, well, it was two and two. His earner average was three. He struck out 30 in 42 innings, but he also walked 28 men. His name, Sandy Koufax. Sandy had 12 at bats that year, and he struck out 12 times. <laughs> Carl, what a ball club that was. You're not kidding. If you're, a, if you're a pitcher, there's two things you need real bad. You need a team that can play defense, and you need a team that can score runs. <clears throat> that team could do both. Well, that's right. And your team scored more runs than anybody in the National League, and your pitchers allowed the fewest runs in the National League. So that's the winning combination. It is. And I think that number is about six a game. I think we averaged about six runs a game that, yep. that year. You did. You did. That's right. Carl, when you got to Brooklyn, Jackie Robinson had been there uh, about a year and a half. And of course, he, we all know, broke the color barrier. Uh, could you sense any tension, uh, especially from the opposing teams, uh, even after that long, when you got there? Well, I think there was plenty of tension with uh, around Jackie for more than one or two years. It, it, uh, on the road, especially uh, after, uh, I know a couple of players like Dixie Walker, who was a Southern uh, gentleman, Leeds, Alabama, where he came from. He didn't want to play with any black players and asked to be traded. Mm. And though he was traded to the Pirates, but in about a year after he saw Jackie play, he rescinded and he said, you know, I have to admit this player, Jackie Robinson, he belongs in the big leagues. He's an outstanding talent and it'd be a shame to keep talent like that out of the big leagues. And yeah. that only took about a year of Jack's, uh, Jackie's uh, showing his talents till even Dixie Walker, who was adamant, I don't play with black players, I play against them, but they, he rescinded. And he said, Jackie is a great uh, major league player and uh, so I thought that was a, a not only uh, there was a couple other Southern boys that also said trade, trade me, but who rescinded. And uh, so anyway, it was a, a challenge. And it was, of course, the culture of the times you were facing that culture, not just uh, just a mild uh, objection. Uh, and so that, that really changed America's relationship uh, with uh, not only blacks but the latin players and so forth but uh, but jackie was uh <laughs> he was a fireball and uh duke snyder's locker was close to jackie's and duke was my roommate and duke said to me one day carl if, if you want to see a game face come down here by my locker because my locker is right across from jackie and hey, come down here on a game uh, game day and you want to see a game face, you look at Jackie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I went down to his locker and sure enough, boy, there was no no kidding around about who was ready to play it was Jackie. He was such an intense competitor. I mean, remember he played football, basketball, baseball, and ran track at UCLA. And uh, another thing that uh, comes to mind is the fact that uh, Pee Wee Reese, who was a Southerner, man from Louisville, Got his nickname because he was a marble champion when he was a junior. And Pee Wee could make Jackie laugh, couldn't he? You know, Pee Wee was a, a realist. Uh, yes, he had a bowling alley. Blacks were not uh, permitted and all that uh, went on. But he lived in Louisville. And at that time, it was not uncommon. Uh, black and white was kept separate. But once he played with Jackie, once he, uh, just like Dixie Walker from Leeds, Alabama, he said, I don't play with uh, black players. I only play against them. Uh, he rescinded uh, and it didn't only take Jackie about one season for everybody to see he was a class person. He was intelligent. He was a fierce competitor. He was good for the game. And uh, even the crowd on the road came out to see Jackie so they could boo him. But he put a new life in the into baseball when he came in and he could run the bases like nobody else. Um, he was uh, had the quickest uh, start. He could be in full stride in two, 
in two strides, he could be full head steam wow. on the base. He was wow. just quick, very quick. Um, you never, ever, hardly ever, and you tell me if I'm wrong, see a player in the major leagues attempt to steal home. You don't, you never see it. Jackie, I, think Rod, I think Rod Carew uh, might be the only one uh, who has numbers of stealing home. Yeah, I might be right, but it's a, it's a rare thing to ever see a player attempt it. And uh, I think Jackie, I think it was 21 times, I believe, including a couple he did in the World Series. Yeah. Uh, stole home. That's but right. you never see uh, normal baseball games. It's a rare thing to ever see. A, uh, I don't remember seeing anybody else steal home myself. Yeah, uh, yeah Rod Carew probably, yeah. But uh, just watching game after game after game, mm -hmm. as I do now on TV, uh, you don't see anybody attempt that. Yeah. All right. So the Dodgers use you as a reliever primarily for your first three seasons. You pitched two games against the Yankees in the 1949 World Series. Did you face Joe DiMaggio? One time. One time. Were you scared? No, actually, I called in a pitch in relief uh, in 49, and I was warming up uh, my warm-up pitches, and I glanced over to the on-deck circle, and then that's where I realized I was about to face Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> I did face him, and uh, he swung at a high fastball, hit it straight up in the infield. So that was the only time I actually faced him in competition. Did you ever face Ted Williams? Never did. Uh, spring training, uh, once or twice, but nothing memorable about uh, uh, him hitting one or me striking him. I don't remember any details, but uh, seldom did I face, ever face Williams. He, they were never in the postseason, the Red Sox. So I never never pitched to him then. But um, again, in 1951, you became a starter. You won uh, 16 games. You were in the bullpen warming up with Ralph Branca in the ninth inning of the deciding game of the National League Playoff Series against the Giants that year. Dodger led four to two in the ninth inning. Pitching change was called for, and uh, the pitching coach at that time for the Dodgers was Clyde Sukforth, and he got on the phone to the uh, dugout, and he told your manager, Chuck Dressen, I, I think Brank has got a little better stuff. I think you got to go with him. Uh, what was his reasoning that day? Well, the only reasoning I can know about was I heard the phone ring in the bullpen, and Clyde Sukforth answered it, Dressen must have asked him, are they ready? He said, yes, they're both ready. Then he must have asked him, how, who's throwing the best? And he didn't distinguish either one. He said, they're both throwing okay. Erskine's bouncing his overhand curveball. So immediately Dressen said, give me Branca. So <laughs> beyond that, you'd have to know some detail. Campanella was not catching that day. We're playing in the polo grounds, and the polo grounds had the longest distance from the home plate to the backstop. Rube Walker was catching. Rube was an outstanding power hitter and an extremely good catcher, but he was very slow afoot, very slow. So with that big distance between the plate and uh, the backstop, uh, I know Dresden must have said, we don't want any wild pitches today. So if Erskine's bouncing his curve, and Campanella is not catching, I better take Branca. Yeah. And you were quoted a letter, somebody said to you, what was your best pitch? And you said the curveball, I bounced in the dirt in the bullpen that day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of tug in cheek there. Uh, that's great. All right, 1952, you captured 14 games, had your lowest earn on average, 2.7. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, and I mentioned him earlier, a uh, Mr. Ben Scully, uh, knew you were going to be on with me today. Uh, and he asked uh, that you please tell what happened the day of game five of the 1952 World Series when you pitched against the Yankees. And I think it all began that morning with, with a telegram you received in the clubhouse, uh, uh, which, as I remember, came from the mayor of Fort Worth. Is that right? Yes, well, I played in Fort Worth at, on the, in the minor league days. And so, yes, I got a telegram from him 
uh, wishing me well on the fifth game of the World Series on the fifth day of October. And a, there were three fives involved right there. Well, it was your fifth uh, wedding anniversary, too. Fifth it? wedding anniversary, yeah. There was four or five fives. Uh, there. So, yeah. And then what happened? I pitched well through the fourth inning. But in the fifth inning, I gave up five runs. You've been ahead now, four to nothing. I was ahead of four nothing. And, uh, well, Mize hit a three-run homer after they scratched a couple of runs in. Then Mize hit a three-run homer. To cap a five-run inning, but here's here's the mystery uh, that might be asked: Well, why didn't Erskine been sent to the showers? Well, Dressen came to the mound, and he said, uh, "Are you feel all right?" And I said, "Charlie, you know how I feel." And now he said, "No physical. Are you okay?" He said, "It was only one ball hit hard off you. That was the Mize home run." So he left me in the game. Now I was uh, shocked to be left in the game. But from that point to the end of the game, which won 11 inning, I got the next 19 in a row. Wow. And we won, we tied, us, tied up the game in the seventh. Uh, my roommate, Duke Snyder, knocked in the run at seventh, and he scored the lead run in the 11th. And we, we hung on to win that game six to five. Yeah. But the, the mystery was, what did Dressen see or feel that uh, he, after that, uh, five run inning did exactly the opposite of whatever fan in the stands sure. or in, elsewhere watching that game says Erskine's had it, but he left me in and I got the next 19 in a row and we won the game in 11 innings. Now here is Vin's favorite part of that story. As the game ended, he looked at the clock and it was five minutes past five. So, so to repeat, Fifth wedding anniversary, Yankees score five in the fifth. Game is over at 5.05. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That's a, yeah. Vinny swears that's the way it happened. Carl, you had a tremendous season in 1953. You led the National League with 20 victories, only six losses, best winning percentage in the league, 769, 16 complete games. Now, in that 1953 World Series, the Yankees won the first two games, and you were the Dodger pitcher in game three. That day, Carl Erskine set a World Series record when he struck out 14 New York Yankees, including three in the ninth inning and one three to two. Carl, do you think that was the best game you ever pitched? Yeah, I think it probably was considering it was World Series. And of course, every player dreams of getting to the series. And every every tree, every player fantasizes that you'll do something good in the series. So to have that record come to me in the series was probably the best game I ever pitched. Did you strike out Yogi Berra to end that game? Yes. He took a third strike. And, and he may have been the last out in that 11 inning game, too. I can't remember. Did you get him strikes on strikes? Uh, Yogi was a tough strikeout. I didn't strike him out a lot, but I did end up that game um, with a strikeout with Yogi. He took a third, took a curveball for strike three. Tell that story about uh, Chuck Dressen uh, instructing you uh, to hit a batter, which you didn't want to do, but. <laughs> well, he didn't want me to hit him. He, he told me before the game in Ebbets Field, we had a short right field, 297, but it was a high fence, about 30 feet high and a screen, uh, a screen wire. And uh, so Dressen called me in before the game. And he said, look, Barra is digging in like, no, but you can't even see his shoe. He's got that back foot buried in the batter's box. He wants to hit it over that short 297 foot uh, distance. So I want you to get a strike on him and then I want you to flatten him. So I never did that before. I never believed much in the knockdown to a, a major league hitter who's not gonna get gun shy on one pitch. But anyway, following the orders, he told me, he said, I'm not asking you, I'm, tell I'm ordering you to do it. Get a strike on Barra, I wanna see him down. Well, the first time he came up, I got a strike on him, and then I threw a pitch inside 
I didn't get it high enough. I hit him in the ribs and he went to first base. So I came in after the inning and uh, Dresden said, that's the lousiest knockdown I ever saw. I want you to get a strike on Barra the next time. And I want to see you do it right. By golly, the next time up, I got a strike on Yogi and I hit him in the elbow the next time. <laughs> he should have gone down, but he just turned away instead of going down and exposed his right elbow. And I hit him, hit him a second time. Anyway, uh, I had a writer tell me one time uh, that you and Yogi are in the record book. I said, how's that? Well, the time you hit him twice, you're the only pitcher who hit the same batter twice in the same game in the World Series. So <laughs> you're, you're in the record book. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> what did Yogi tell you uh, when you came to, to bat? Oh, I came, to hit the, I came up to hit the, after I hit him a second time, I came up to hit the next inning. And he's sitting behind the plate looking at, up at me through his mask. Yogi had a very deep voice. And he said, in a real soft-spoken, Carl, are you throwing at me? Just like, you wouldn't throw at me, would you? <laughs> I hit the first pitch and got out of there. Uh, and you were good friends. Oh, we were, yeah, we were good, good friends. And we had a lot of time together off the field at baseball functions. So Yogi was fun to be with. And of course he was, he was a tough hitter. He, he's what we call in baseball, a bad ball hitter. Oh yeah. He did He didn't have to have a good strike. No. He, if he could reach it, high outside, low inside. He went up there, like the story goes, which is who knows if it's true. He went to the plate one day and he was holding the, the, the mark on the bat, the trademark was holding it on the back side of the bat. And, he, and the catcher said, Yogi, you, you're holding the uh, bat in the wrong direction. You gotta have that trademark on top so you can read it. Supposedly, Yogi said, I didn't come up here to read. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> All right, you won 18 games in 1954, and oh, then 11, yeah. and then 13, to give you six straight double-digit win seasons before you retired. And I want to remind people that in those days of the National League, there were only eight teams. And your ball club won 98 games that year. Uh, you finished 13 and a half games ahead of uh, second place Milwaukee. You wound up 38 and a half games ahead of the Pirates, who five years later won the World Series. But uh, there was something. And another thing a lot of people don't realize, Carl, That's that so year good. in 55, when you won it all, so the Dodgers good. barely, barely reached 1 million in home attendance. They made it by 33,000 fans. Yeah, those were the days, actually, the TV hadn't really made its impact yet. Um, later, you know, that TV saved the, the sports, not only of baseball, but all sports. But, uh, yeah, those early years, it took a while for TV to catch on. And, uh, you know, of course, they, uh, we played all uh, almost all day games in those days. And once we started playing night games, television became even more important because a lot of people never could see a day game on TV because mm -hmm. we're playing, uh, they're at work, working. So, but TV was a good marriage for sports. Anyway, but. Well, a couple more notes on your 55 Dodgers. Uh, that you were 94 and 48 that year against opposing right-handed pitchers, but you had a losing record four wins and seven losses against left-handers. The other teams didn't want to pitch left-handers against you, did they? They did not. In fact, one of the best pitchers in baseball history was Warren Spahn. Yeah. And they, the Braves would not pitch him in, against us in Ebbets Field. Uh, Ebbets Field was a short uh, fences uh, down the right field, especially, but uh, that Spawny didn't like that. He was a, such a competitor. He, he was, he was really irritated that they wouldn't pitch him against that right-handed lineup of ours in Evans field. But, um, that was, that was just the way it was in those days. Well, one of the great pitching games of all time, uh, Warren Spawn against uh, Juan Marichal, the, uh, 
Braves and the Giants, nothing, nothing to the 16th inning. And Willie Mays hit a home run to win it for the Giants, one nothing. I mean, talk yeah. about great pitching, huh? Yeah, that's, that, that was an outstanding game. Another surprising note was your team that year had a losing record in extra inning games, seven and nine. And in the one run games, you were only 21 and 19. And yet you ran away from everybody. Yeah. Well, those are well, numbers I haven't heard, but it's interesting. I asked Roy Campanella one day, uh, many years after he retired, about the money that the current players were making. And he said to me, Ross, we didn't care about the money. All we cared about was winning. Yeah, he was right. He was right. You know, the, all the numbers that make up baseball, the only one number that really ends up meaning anything is the wins and losses. Yeah. Earned run average, yes, it's there. It's, it's, uh, it's attainable. For, uh, some of the great pitchers had great ERAs, but in the last, how would you rather have pitchers that have a great ERA or the team that have a winning season? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, wins and losses. Tough. It's a, it's a public record what the yearly salaries were with the Dodgers. Um, in the first year in Major League Baseball, you were paid $6,000, then up to 12000 to 18000 Next season, you signed for $27,500. But the following year, your salary was cut to 27000 Why? Oh, it was just the way it was done. We were all on one-year contracts. So even the managers, no, no managers in my era had multi-year contracts until very late in my career, DeRocher got a two-year contract at one time. And our manager, Dressen, he wanted two years and he couldn't get it. And they, they finally fired him. <laughs> and that's when Alston took over. That's right. That's right. Well, when Don Newcomb won 20 games that year, Dodgers were paying him $17,500. And uh, Clem Levine got $13,000. Uh, the Hall of Famers received more. Roy Campanella, $42,000. Jackie Robinson and Duke Snyder, $35,000 each. How about Sandy Koufax his first year? $6,000. Yeah. That was fifty-five. Yeah. And when you look at the ages of that team, Pee Wee Reese was 37, Jackie Robinson, 36, Roy Campanella and Carl Ferrillo, both 33, Gil Hodges, 31, you and Don Newcomb, each 29, Duke Snyder and Clem Levine, both 28, Jim Gilliam, 26, and Johnny Potter is the kid at 22. Was all that experience, Carl, a factor in the success of the Brooklyn Dodgers? Naturally, you know, you had to factor that in at the top of the list because uh, have you been there before? Yes, uh, that makes a difference. So I was fortunate to uh, be with a team in 12 seasons, won the National League Championship six times. So, you know, you've been there before, you've been there before, you've been there before. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot to that. Well, you've had 65 years to think about this. And I just wanted to ask you this today. Have you been able to figure out how the Yankees beat the Dodgers five of the six times they played them in the World Series between 1947 and 1956? Yeah, I think the Yankees had voodoo dolls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had a lot of close games, though, didn't you? you yeah, were, we did. Yeah, yeah, but that was a mystery to us too, man for man and all that. The only, the only, uh, uh, the only difference that was measurable, uh, their pitching matched up with us better than our pitching matched up mm. with the with the Yankees. Wow, uh, we had right-handed power. Their best pitchers, uh, of course, Rashi was their top pitcher, uh, but their uh, their pitching staff matched better for them that we matched ours. But that's, a, that's the one statistical thing you can point to. Mm -hmm. 
Well, all in all, between 1949 and 1956, you appeared in 11 World Series games, seven of them as a starter. Your record in those encounters was two and two, wins in 52 and 53, losses in 52 and 56. Carl Erskine is our special guest today. We're going to flash back to his two no-hitters in a moment. But first, I want you to tell our audience about an experience that you and Duke Snyder had right after the Dodgers won the 1955 World Series. You know what I'm talking about? I do. You got in the car and you were gonna to come to Anderson, I guess, to rest. Well, we were, and you were driving, driving back. Yeah, we were driving back. Uh, we both had Cadillacs and we were tailing each other. And on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, we got stopped. And uh, after he checked us, checked the license and the registration and all that, uh, he, he finally uh, said, you know, uh, I lost money on you guys this year. He said, what? We won. This is the year we won. He said, yeah, but I bet on you in 49, 52, 53. <laughs> <laughs> so when he left, I said, Duke, you just met a loser. <laughs> you told me you said you, you just met a born loser. <laughs> He's a born loser. Yeah. Well, there were seven no-hitters pitched in the National League in the 1950s. And Carl Erskine pitched two of them. The first one in 1952 against the Cubs. There was a threat of rain that night, wasn't there? Yeah, third inning, it rained hard. And uh, of course, I was hurrying to try to get five. We scored five runs, I think, in the first inning or two. And official game has to be five full innings. So I was hurrying every pitch to get five innings in before this heavy rain was about to come down. But by the third inning, uh, I pitched at uh, Willard Ramsdale, uh, the pitcher who, who couldn't hit uh, a ball if you held it for him in front. But <laughs> I walked him on four pitches trying to hurry up and beat the rain. And it was a 40 minute delay. And then we came back and finished the game, a no hitter. And Ramsdale was the only base runner. <laughs> wow. We consider in history. Carl, you may, you may know this, but if you didn't, I want to make you feel better because you told me that story about Willie Ramsdale in the past, and I looked it up last night. In the two years before your no-hitter, Willie had 10 hits in 1950 and nine hits in 1951 with the Reds. He wound he up was. with 22 hits in his five seasons. He batted 156. There was only one negative note. In 1952, when you tossed your no-hitter, Willie Ramsdale had 18 at-bats and walked once against <laughs> you. <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> <laughs> Carl's second no-hitter came against the rival Giants in 1956. Now, what about that one? Well, that was sweet because the Giants and the Dodgers, of course, in the same league, and the competition was fierce. Uh, with us, so to, to beat the Giants in front of the home crowd uh, at Evans Field with a no-hitter made it extra special. Well, somebody in New York, at the New York Times of all places, once wrote, the Brooklyn Dodgers of the 1950s was the best team the majors ever saw. Well, it's a uh, High compliment, but I would say out of those years, most of us who were on the 53 team, 1953, felt like that was absolutely the best, uh, the best Dodger team. We didn't see, of course, a lot of teams before and after us, but uh, felt like that was our best team ever was the 53 Dodgers. We did not win the World Series that year either, not until 55. Yeah. Then has told me that your team would sit in the clubhouse after a tough loss and talk for some time about what went wrong that night and how to fix it. Nowadays, the players just get out of there as fast as they can. There's a saying, 25 players, 
25 taxi cabs. <laughs> well, I never was a beer drinker, but one of our sponsors almost always was a beer. And there was always a rule after a game, if you won, uh, the cooler was open. If you lost, no beer. Well, I did. I wasn't a beer drinker anyway, but uh, you could always tell the guys getting out of the clubhouse fast after, after a loss. Yeah. But you talked a lot of strategy among yourselves, even on the tough nights. You know, that team uh, bonded very well. Um, I don't know if Jackie had something to do with that. It, it might have. But that team uh, really did have a good uh, relationship with each other, uh, a bonding, I call it. And uh, I think that played itself out sometimes on a lot of those close series that we had. But, uh, you know, baseball is, uh, is what it is. You, you look at it one way on paper, but you got to play it out there on the dirt and the grass. Carl, you hit one home run in the major leagues. Who was that against? That was against the Giants. And, uh, oh, excuse me, against the Cubs and uh, sad Sam Jones. And I always <laughs> wondered if he was sad before that or after that. <laughs> A pitcher, you know, you bear down hard on the other pitcher. Yeah. And I always tried not to be a strikeout. And I just got a pitch that day and hit it good. Was that and, in Wrigley Field or Evans Field? No, Evans Field. Was it? Uh, yeah. And you also, had, you also had a hit in the World Series game, didn't you? I got one hit, one single. Who yeah. was that off? That was off of Rashi. Big, Big Rashi. Yeah. yeah. He had one career save. What was that? No, I had uh, 13 saves. You did? Well, you're talking about World Series? No, I'm just talking about, I, I no, think. I think, I didn't even realize that st stat existed. Yeah, well, we'll pass on that. But, um, uh, well, I was surprised myself to see this, this stat, but it's it get in the record book, it gives me uh, credit for 13 saves, which I didn't even know they kept track of those in, in my right. day. Yeah, I didn't think that started until after you were through. Carl, let me ask you some questions. You give me as brief an answer as you want to. Best hitter you ever saw? Stan Musial. Hit to all fields. Had big power. Toughest hitter for you to get out? Probably Musial. Although I had a very good record against the Cardinals, Musial still got his 330-plus hits off of me. Best hitters that you enjoyed success against because you got them out. Oh, gee, I never picked, I never played that game. But I owned anybody. <laughs> Mantle, I was able to strike out quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, I just, a fan just told me this recently. In four World Series, I faced Mantle 12 times and uh, got him eight strikeouts. Wow. Wow. But he, he does, my stuff just matched up right for him. Overhand curveball. He chased it, and Stingle would come out of the dugout screaming at Mantle, lay off of that pitch, lay off of that pitch. <laughs> Best pitcher you have seen? I think Warren Spahn would qualify for that. He won when he didn't have good stuff. Uh, he pitched a long time. You know, he he, he won three, 335 games. He was also a good hitter. And an odd statistic, he got 335 hits in his career. Wow. Yeah. Amazing statistic. Yeah. Um, all right. Just, now just give us a yes or no on these next few questions. Should Shoeless Joe Jackson be in the Hall of Fame? Say it again. I'm sorry. Shoeless Joe Jackson. Should he be oh, in the Hall of Fame? Oh, Shoeless. I wasn't sure he wasn't already in there. No. Nope. Well, he's famous. I can't speak to his stats uh, to be qualified for that. So I, yeah. I can't really give you a straight answer. Okay. The 1919 uh, Black Sox scandal pro has prohibited him, but Absolutely, the, word, yeah. the, the word was he never took any money, but he knew what was going on. And that was yeah. Judge okay. Landis banding. Gil right. Hodges, 
Yes, absolutely. And he will be uh, this year in December will be the last chance for Gil to make it. But he was a premier first baseman through the whole 1950s. Uh, he has the numbers that uh, qualify him. Uh, he missed a couple times uh, by a vote or two. He should make it this year. Maury Wills. Yeah, Maury, you know, he's he brought base running back. Yes, he did. And brought the excitement of base running back. Uh, yeah, I'd say he's a, a good qualifier for that. Should Pete Rose That's be in the Hall of Fame? Who is that? Pete Rose. He already is in the f minds of the fans. He gets treated like a Hall of Famer. Uh, so there's a great commercial on TV one time. He was walking down a hall and his wife was calling to him in a voiceover. Pete, Pete, you're not supposed to be in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, he should be in there. What about Barry Bonds? Well, you got to play games with that one. If you talk about steroids and, and the steroid era, um, I'd say he hit, he still had to hit the ball. He's got the numbers. He should be in there. And of course, that Roger Clemens would be in the same category, wouldn't he? I guess he would be, yes. Yeah. How about Tommy John? Now, there's a pitcher that was so durable. I knew Tommy quite well. Yep. And he said, you know, the secret to my success was a, my catcher who told me one day, Tommy, you work too hard. When you don't throw the ball as hard, it moves more. You right. need to back off and just throw that sinker about 80%. Mm -hmm. And he said, after that, I started winning like crazy. Yeah. He, he has one of the most interesting statistics I think I've ever heard, Carl, in sports. Before the operation, he won 124 games. After the operation, he won 164 games to wind up with 288. Wow, wow. Well, he not only did that, he he paved the way for dozens of pitchers to yeah. make it in the big leagues. Oh, Dr. Frank Job ought to be in the Hall of Fame too for the hundreds of pitchers' careers he saved. Yeah, true. And but but Tommy John was still pitching at 46 years old. Oh no, yeah, he had a rubber arm. Yeah. Well, he said his catcher helped him, told him quit throwing so hard. Yeah, that sinker goes better when you throw about 80%. Carl, don't you love poetry? I do. Can you recite a, a poem for us? There's strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moral for gold. The Arctic trails have told their tales. That's the beginning anyway. That's the terrific. cremation of Sam McGee. Oh, well, that's terrific. Well, You've had such a, a glorious life and you and, and Betty and um, your family and our family have a mutual connection. We have a grandson who was born with Down syndrome, had three heart surgeries the first 18 months of his life, survived, is now 27 and a tremendous joy for our family. And you and Betty have a similar experience which uh, I'd like you to share. You're talking basically about my son, Jimmy, I guess, right? right? right. Yeah. Well, you know, Jimmy was born as a surprise after uh, three healthy kids, but Jimmy has brought into our family a bonding that uh, I don't know how to explain it, but he is a, he's a sweet kid. He's uh, easy to love and, uh, He's really been the glue in our family, really. Although we didn't necessarily need that, but he's a loving soul. Uh, people like Jimmy. He's been a special Olympian. He uh, was a good swimmer. Uh, he now bowls. He does well in bowling. And uh, How old so Jim, is he, Carl? Jimmy is 61 years old. Wow. And he was... Uh, an Applebee's 21 years. Did he say that? What, Betty? Applebee's. Oh, they reminded, Betty was reminding me, Jimmy worked at Applebee's restaurant 
for uh, 20 years. Wow. He got a 20 year uh, celebration when he retired after 20 years. Wow. Uh, so Jimmy is uh, uh, limited in lots of ways, but he has a he has a neat personality. Uh, people engage him, and uh, he's open and friendly. Uh, and uh, he's been a real blessing in our family. And so it's made us see a whole population we might have missed if Jimmy hadn't come into our lives. And That's right. It's That's been right. a rich experience. Well, I know faith. Is an important part of your life always has been you're right about that and uh uh i've often said uh when you get married they say uh, two people become one but betty and i found out with the lord in our lives two people became three hmm. wonderful beautiful i want to point out that um the carl and betty erskine I guess it's a it's a society and it? a designation that that raises money for the Special Olympics, which you have really been involved with for, I think, over 40 years now. Well, it's true. Of course, it's because of Jimmy. Uh, he started Special Olympics when he was 10 years old. He would be a 50 uh, year participant this year. Wow. Now, the all the problems that we've had uh, with crowds and the rest of it. Uh, he didn't get to participate uh, much this year in the state meet, but uh, yeah, he's uh, he's been an active uh, participant in Special Olympics, uh, particularly swimming and now bowling. And you've also been very involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes over the years. Well, he's been with me on, and Betty on many trips with FCA. Yes, Jimmy's well known with a lot of uh, athletes around the country because uh, he did attend FCA with us uh, several times. Anyone who knows Carl Erskine will tell you that this is one of the finest human beings you'd ever meet. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you've done since you've been out of baseball. You went into the insurance business for a while. You coached baseball at Anderson College for 12 seasons through 1973. You became a leader in the community. You became president of a bank in Anderson for 11 years. A six foot bronze statue of you was built in front of the Carl Erskine Rehabilitation and Sports Medicine Center. A new school was built on land that you donated. It was named Erskine Elementary. You've given your time to the baseball assistance team, which helps former players through financial and medical difficulties. They still remember you with, with great affection in Brooklyn. A street was uh, rented, uh, well, it was created first and named after you, Erskine Street. And I got a note today from a fellow named James Clark. He knew you were gonna be on. And he said, Ross, when he, when he was here, all the fans in Brooklyn knew him as Oisk. And I remember one time, Carl had been gone from Brooklyn for many, many years. He came back into the neighborhood and he got out of a taxi and a guy up on the second floor yelled down at him, Oisk, can I get your bags? <laughs> That's how popular he was in Brooklyn. But uh, you were inducted into the uh, Indiana National Baseball uh, Hall of Fame in 1979. Uh, you've written several books on baseball. I know one of them was really about Jackie Robinson, wasn't it? It was. Well, he was my teammate. Uh, for nine seasons, and uh, I got to watch Jackie both uh, in, at his best and, and when the heat was on the most. Uh, he handled it and became one of the great players. Of course, he's a Hall of Famer, and uh, I think there's something symbolic about Jackie making the Hall of Fame after Blacks were not permitted in pro baseball for years, but uh, with, with Jackie in the Hall of Fame, if you go to Cooperstown and see the oval room where all the plaques are around the wall, Jackie's plaque is the same color of everybody else. Yeah. So it's a symbolic thing, but I think of that, that Jackie uh, himself uh, is, uh, is bronze and he matches everybody else. It's kind of a symbolic thing. This is a fabulous time that we've had with you. I will never be able to thank you enough for 
giving us the time and really sharing so many wonderful experiences. Uh, God bless you. You look wonderful, 94 years old. I think you're one of the best looking 94 year old men I'd ever known. And uh, we just you know what? My mother said that. Yeah, well, she had an idea. She did. <laughs> Carl, thank you. For Ross, it's great to talk with you again and uh, bless your heart and uh, stay well. You too. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Jim Denny out in Anderson and Mike Cunard up in Roseburg, Oregon for their technical assistance today. Uh, I think that it was a uh, well-spent time with the, the wonderful Carl Erskine. Now, so long, have a good day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much.